Life Audio. You're listening to Therapy and Theology, and I'm your host, Carly Merclear. This podcast is a space where we explore popular topics and questions related to the convergence of faith, feelings, spiritual formation, and more. My prayer is that through these conversations, we will grow in our awareness of who we are as beloved children of God, learn to acknowledge our needs and emotions with curiosity and compassion, and rediscover the purpose and power of our unique stories through the lens of the gospel. As a licensed therapist and ministry leader, I want to give voice to the many questions we face while cultivating a clearer view of how our faith informs our healing journey. I don't have all the answers, but I am committed to going deeper and walking together. So whether you've been to therapy or know exactly what you believe when it comes to theology, I want to invite you to join this journey as we fearlessly name the complexities of our present reality and press into the hope of the gospel story. So are you ready? Let's jump into today's question and begin this journey together. How do you make a radio ad for an 8K TV that conveys the feeling of 33 million pixels with over a billion shades of color hitting your eyeballs? This is the best we can do. Samsung Neo QLED 8K. Unreasonably good. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Therapy and Theology. I thought I would start this season off by sharing a little bit of background on the purpose of this podcast, the framework for where we'll be going in the episodes to come, and a little background on my own personal journey. So for those of you that don't know me yet, my name is Carly Mercoulier. I say I'm a northerner by heart and a southerner by choice, and I currently live in the beautiful state of Virginia. I moved here in 2010 uh, with the plan to complete a degree in religion and work full-time in ministry. While I was in college, I began working with a youth ministry team and quickly discovered the disconnect between what so many of my students were facing and then the cultural Christian method of discipleship, which often overlooks or even underestimates the impact of emotional health. This experience sent me searching for answers, and I could talk about this forever, but it brought me back to the reality of how do we bring the truths of God's Word to the challenging realities of our world. And so this vision for what we call integration brought me to return to school and get a degree in clinical mental health counseling so that I could seek to bridge the gap between our emotional health and our spiritual well-being. I like to say that my journey to getting to this current place in life was all planned out, but rarely is that the case, right? My healing journey up to this point testifies to the many ways God has so carefully directed me to where I am presently. Yet I will go first in saying that this journey has its battles and I have my share of bruises. Through my work in counseling and ministry over the last decade, and also along with my personal journey of healing, I have been brought deeper than I ever imagined I had the capacity to go. It has rocked my faith, changed me at my core, and continues to cultivate in my soul an awareness of God's heart for His children. So the birth of this podcast has been both a calling and I believe a culmination of my heart's desire to walk with others on this healing journey, both emotionally and spiritually. So with this in mind, the producers of Life Audio and I decided to rebrand my original podcast, Reframed, The Power of Perspective, to its current name, Therapy and Theology. And my hope with this change is that it will capture the intention and direction of my purpose in each episode to explore the questions and topics that correlate to this intersection between emotional health and spiritual well-being. Okay, so with all of that being said, I want to jump into the first question I often am asked when it comes to embarking on this journey. The question is this, where do I even begin? As an Enneagram one, starting at the beginning is always a very good place to start in my book. Um, But I remember so, so vividly when I first asked this question for my own work and for my own healing journey. I was in my young 20s and I felt the weight of questions I did not have the answers to. And this quickly isolated me from community. And as a Christian in full-time ministry at the time, I felt paralyzed to ask for help because I was certain it meant that I would be seen differently. 
till this point, I think I had assumed that my spiritual journey needed to reflect perfection. And instead of seeing my community as a place of safety and confession where I could ask questions to deepen my self-awareness and my need for Jesus, I resorted to isolation and I was ashamed that I was even struggling. Unfortunately, this is so often the story I hear from the many people I walk with as a therapist. We have believed for far too long that struggling equals spiritual immaturity. And in an attempt to avoid maybe these signs of spiritual weakness, we force pretense. And we feel even afraid to speak about the painful parts of our story. And this leaves us stuck though, doesn't it? In many ways, we can feel stagnant in our spiritual growth also because we feel like we cannot be honest with others, with the Lord, and even ourselves. And so this is where we find ourselves. We learn to disintegrate from our story, dismissing our emotional experiences, shaming our thoughts that don't feel holy, and believing that God's love is contingent on our Christian ability. Or, in contrast, what I see often is that the pain of storylines that include suffering can create such significant doubt that left unattended to can encourage an incomplete deconstruction process that leaves many hearts wounded with religious beliefs that are not scriptural in nature. And so, although these are not specific categories that we want to place people in, I think I can see both sides of the spectrum in my own story, and maybe you can as well. But what if there was another option? Instead of disintegrating from our story and dismissing maybe our experience, and then also not running away from the truths of Scripture because they don't fit within our reality, what if the gospel narrative actually teaches us how to hold the complexities of our stories, where pain is given a seat at the table and welcome to partake in the process of redemption? This is not cleaned up or pretty, but it's honest, raw, and real. It is the kind of work that shatters our man-made images of worth and reconstructs a vision of true biblical flourishing. So I want to welcome you, wherever you find yourself currently, that where you are is holy ground. It is here that we are invited into the process of reconstructing our view of ourselves, our story, God, and the world. So as we seek to explore various questions throughout each episode, we will look at the connection they have to our faith and our formation. And I want to provide you today with just some first steps to starting this healing journey. So when we ask the question, where do I even begin? It seems so daunting to step into this process of untangling my thoughts and beliefs and recognizing what's going on inside of me. But I want to give you three set simple steps to get started. One, start with your story. Two, find sacred spaces. And three, dive into spiritual resources. So let's break these down really quickly. Number one, start with your story. You know, in the counseling space, the first thing we ever do is we start with the client's story. This is what we call an intake session. And every part of the story provides context for current functioning. You know, where we've been really helps us know where we're going. And so I recently heard a speaker say this, the story we live in is the story we live out. So what we believe about our experiences shapes our perception of everything. Within therapy, there are countless modalities and interventions that seek to provide a roadmap for this healing process. But one that I have found to be so powerful for the healing work is taken from narrative therapy, or as some people call it, story work. Do you know the story that you're living in? Have you ever shared your story with someone that you feel like is safe? You know, there is power in engaging with our stories for many reasons, you know, from a therapeutic view or things we do in therapy that help us emotionally. Knowing our story increases our self-awareness. It also helps us recognize how our life and relationships have formed our uh, interactions with one another. Knowing why we do the things that we do helps us understand ourselves better. Likewise, from a spiritual formation standpoint, our story illuminates the greater narrative of Scripture. We all have to answer the questions related to origin, brokenness, restoration, and these themes within our lives 
speak to a greater narrative. I also, though, have people ask me frequently, but why, Carly? <laughs> why? What's the point of going back through the bad memories and the deep heartache and admitting the present challenges I'm facing right now? And I'll tell you something I tell my clients frequently. The story we tell ourselves has the most power in our lives. Stories form us, don't they? Think about your favorite novels and the way that they've shifted and connected with you. You know, our story has the potential to shape us in the most powerful ways. So not engaging with that story really leaves us out from the work that can be done. Dan Allender says this in his book, To Be Told. He says, we are in the presence of a good story when the flaw that shatters shalom is also the doorway to redemption. Whether it be our own flaw or the sin of others, God uses the raw material of sin to create the edifice of his redeemed glory. There are so many ways to start engaging with your story, but I think one of the most prevalent would be just self-reflection. You know, you can do this through timeline work or writing your story, um, naming the things that you've been through or the big, what we call moments in life that have shaped us. And then I would encourage you to bring this into what I call sacred space. This is number two. Sacred spaces are what I like to define as safe places to engage with our story. I believe that finding these places to speak honestly, to share freely, to really uh, say whatever you need to say in order to get to where you're going. This is a messy process, but we need places to do that. And seeking counsel in this space is really important. You know, Brene Brown in her book, Daring Greatly, explains that if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame cannot survive. And I think this is so, so true. And I've experienced this in my own story. When we speak things out loud with other people that can take in that, that word or that phrase or that story and say, I'm so sorry, or me too, it just shatters the hold that that um, storyline can have on us. I also recommend finding your own personal counselor if you're looking to start this work or a spiritual director to walk with you. Uh, I know that for me, my, my church family and my pastor and my counselor have all been intrinsically important in this process for me. Um, there are so many benefits to being in community. You know, attachment specialist Dana Poole Heller explains that healing cannot happen in isolation. So we are built intrinsically through our DNA to to heal in relationship. This attachment is so important. And so finding safe people, maybe that's not your family of origin, maybe that's not your relatives or, or people that are close to you currently. So finding those people and building that support system, although it might sound overwhelming, I encourage you to start slow and find one or two safe sources that you can go to and start engaging with your story. Lastly, I really encourage people to seek out spiritual resources. You know, from an integrative perspective, healing is part of our spiritual formation process. And if you're unfamiliar with this term, spiritual formation, Dallas Willard defines it as the process of becoming conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and for the sake of others. And this is our aim in our healing work as believers. It's a call to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ so that we can glorify God in our strengths and our weaknesses, and we can do it for the sake of others to empower and encourage and exhort. So what does it look like to become like Jesus? Well, we need to go back to truth, right? We need to fill our minds with the things that renew us and, and allow us to know what is pleasing to God. So what are you listening to? What are you reading? I often ask my clients, are you listening to yourself or are you talking to yourself? And if you're talking to yourself, what truths are you meditating on today? Scripture can feel overwhelming for many, and so I want to give a disclaimer that we're not doing this alone. And so if, if Scripture is something new to you, I encourage you to lean into those support systems, right, that we're creating, and go to sacred spaces where you can start learning how to get into the Word and understand truth. This is a step-by-step -step process. It is slow, and it is a day-by-day -day thing. So it is through seeking out these resources and meditating on the truths of God's word, we can begin to rewire our thought patterns and develop a deeper belief that is based on truth rather than our experience or our feelings. So I hope that these three steps can help you begin this healing journey. 
It's not about making drastic changes all at once, but simply opening yourself up to the process. Today, I want to close with a liturgy from Every Moment Holy, and I pray that it will be a anchor point for us as we try to hold the complexities of our current reality and see the coming glory of God's restoration and hope. For this is who we are, a people of the promise, a people shaped in the image of God, whose very being generates all hope in the universe, yet who also weep and grieve its brokenness. So we, your children, are liberated to lament our losses, even as we simultaneously rejoice in hope of their coming restoration. Let me learn now, O Lord, to do this as naturally as an inhale and exhale of a single breath, to breathe out sorrow, to breathe in joy, to breathe out lament, and to breathe in hope, to breathe out pain and to breathe in comfort, to breathe out sorrow, to breathe in joy. In one hand, I grasp the burden of my grief, while the other, I reach for the hope of grief's redemption. Here in the tension of the two, between what was and what will be, is now. And let my heart be surprised by, shaped by, warmed by, remade by the same joy that forever wells within and radiates from your heart, O oh God. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Therapy and Theology. If you have a question or topic you would like discussed on a future episode, please feel free to email me or drop it in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe to have each week's episode instantly downloaded to your podcasts and see the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode. To access more content and join my monthly email list for the latest updates and info, visit my website at carlymarcouillier.com. <laughs>